I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Art Smith to begin his side of the presentation, and I'll let Art introduce himself. And there he is. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, my Thank name you. is Art Smith, and for the last 43 years, I've been with the uh, newspapers, uh, both the Marietta Times and the Parkersburg News. Uh, part of my job has been a photographer, a designer, a um, editor. Uh, I manage our websites. And uh, I, I've seen a lot of photos of Marietta. I've taken a lot of photos for Marietta of Marietta. So uh, today um, we're going to look at some some of those. Uh, I, I want to start off with a state of the art camera from 1900. So this would be what people would have used um, in 1900 to take photos of Marietta. So you can imagine the struggle of taking a photo you know people have asked me what's the best camera to use i always say the one that you'll have with you imagine ha having to carry that around so uh this is uh a little bit more advanced from that from there this is a camera from about 1920 and you'll notice it's about the same size as an iphone and the iphone is uh really the most used camera today so um, I, I kind of wanted to kind of start off with uh, looking at some, some pictures and, and um, at the end we'll have some time for some questions. So um, So you can see the comparison between the, uh, the large camera from 1900 and the uh, iPhone of today. Um, part of what I've done uh, over the last 10 years is uh, really looked in depth at the um, historical photos of Marietta, both in terms of uh, uh, photos and of schools. And we've produced a number of books, uh, several of which are available in the gift shop of the castle if you visit, uh, as well as the newsandsentinel.com slash books that you see. Two of them, um, Wood County Remembered and Washington County Remembered, uh, have extensive photos of Marietta, and it's from those books that some of the photos that we'll see today uh, came from. So let's talk about people that came before us. Uh, and we can thank um, some of these individuals for really providing a um, deep level of photos of Marietta. Uh, the first is uh, Professor Thomas Bisco, who uh, was at Marietta College and photographed uh, with a camera much like what you saw and um, really shot some landscapes that preserved what Marietta looked like before it really got built up around the turn of the century. Uh, the, the, the next person, Harry Fisher, uh, photographed Marietta for a, a long period of time and shot thousands of photos. And uh, they uh, are available for um, the public to look at. Uh, hundreds of them are digitized and are available on, on the Marietta College website. The third person, uh, Esther Wood Hogue, uh, owned and operated the Hotel um, Lafayette in Marietta. Uh, he was a photographer, but he also collected a lot of images that other people took. And all three of these photographers' uh, collections are housed in the special collections uh, at the Merida College Library. And, and it's from that that um, most people that um, uh, work with historical photos of Marietta uh, gather their images from because it's such an extensive collection. So let's go ahead and look at some of the photos. Um, this is the Lafayette, uh, the bottom, the way we see it today, the top, the way it would have appeared in, in around 1940 before um, Derwood Hogue removed the buildings next to it to make way for both his ballroom area and a parking lot. He, he was a bit of a visionary and he saw the need to provide parking for a public that was increasingly traveling by car instead of, of train and riverboat. Uh, before the Lafayette and before 
the um, hotel that preceded it uh, was the Lincoln Building. And much the way the Lafayette kind of has to wrap around that, that odd corner, uh, it, it did as well. Um, so you end up with buildings that aren't exactly rec rectangular. Uh, many times when you look at photos, uh, you, you can kind of find a lot of information out by what's either included or excluded in the photo. So if we look at the photo at the top, uh, we, we can um, summarize that this is prior to 1935, because it was in November of that year that the City Hall, which you can see the uh, tower of right here, uh, caught fire and burned uh, after a prisoner uh, set fire to it. Uh, there's some Christmas decorations on the pool, on the pole, so we can kind of uh, figure that this is a, a Christmas season uh, in the 1930s. Um, very busy street. Note the diagonal parking. Uh, you know, many of those buildings that are seen in the photo are still there today, and the bottom view is of Putnam Street uh, recently. Uh, this is Fort near Washington in buildings that still exist. The a and grocery store, uh, for recent memory of most people, has been a place where you can get your hair cut. But it was a place at this time where you could buy your groceries in an era where we had a lot of small neighborhood grocery stores. If you look at the far left of the photo, uh, you can see um, uh, part of Washington School. This is the armory uh, front lawn. And you know the armory has long been a location for protests and rallies and politicians. Richard Nixon spoke from those steps and, and other people. Um, this was a very important speaker on this day. If you look at the top of the steps, you see Santa Claus. So this is uh, probably following a Christmas parade or a Christmas program uh, uh, down Front Street. Uh, this is a intersection that uh, if you're in Marietta, you travel through um, from time to time. This would be Putnam Street, 7th Street, the road up to the quote, new high school uh, built in the 1920s. And this is Goose Run. And Goose Run runs through Marietta and through Marietta College uh, before exiting the uh, community uh, in the Muskingum near the train bridge. The only building that you'll recognize today is Irwin Hall right here. Uh, this building was married at Hall and it was torn down in 1987. Harrison Hall was constructed in uh, 2012, occupies that space today. Uh, speaking of Goose Run, so Goose Run flows through the college and then it, it kind of disappears and disappears under Butler Street because they built this very large brick culvert covered it up, raised the area so uh, the town was all the same level and uh, people kind of forgot about it. But that creek is still there and it flows under some buildings. It also flows under 4th Street. So if you um, walk down 4th towards Green Street, when you cross Goose Run, if, if you hike down um, the riverbank, you'll see that uh, you're actually crossing a bridge that was built in 1867. And this is a uh, uh, still used every day. If you drive down 4th Street, you cross it. And it's one of many um, more than 100 year old stone structures that were built and many of which are still being used today. Uh, Cyrus Moore, when he talks about the railroad, he'll, he'll show some other examples of um, this type of structure. A circus came to town. Uh, the Greatest Show on Earth unloaded on the tracks on Butler Street. In the background, you can see Tiber Way and some other buildings. Uh, the date, well, we know um, by this parade photo, because if you look at the building in the background, uh, the workers are pausing to uh, take a look at the animals as they pass. And uh, that is the armory, which was constructed in 1914. So we can we can pinpoint that photo to the construction of, uh, of the armory. Uh, aerials are uh, very cool photos to look at. 
because they give you a wide view of an area of an area and, and um, many of the old ones had a lot of details because of the resolution of these very large cameras. And of course, this isn't an aerial because it was shot prior to um, the Wright brothers taking their flight at Kitty Hawk. We know that because there's no Williamstown Bridge in the photo. And that bridge was built in 1903. Uh, the bridges that are here, the Putnam Street Bridge, the um, Railroad Bridge, uh, don't really look like the bridges that we kind of grew up looking at. Uh, that's because those bridges were later destroyed. Uh, there's been several Putnam Street bridges um, that were e either removed because of uh, the structure was unsafe or were destroyed by floods. So notice the dual swing spans as a uh, switch side of, of the river that, that uh, would be beyond the lock. Uh, th this is a more recent photo. This is uh, the interstate area and Pike Street. And this is just prior to the bridge opening. So the bridge opened December 1967. So this is probably the summer of 1967. You can see the traffic cones directing people off. This is where Kmart, McDonald's, uh, Bob Evans, the hotels, the sewage treatment plant, uh, the whole shopping center would be in this area. This would be where uh, Kroger and that complex is. And these ponds here are still here today. They're part of the Kroger wetlands uh, area. So, um, and then Duck Creek goes up the side. Travel further out Pike Street, uh, 1947, you would have found uh, the Marietta Airport. Um, yes, Marietta had an airport and it was located um, about where Aldi's and uh, Physician Care is, uh, right across the street from the Marietta Country Club which at that time extended all the way to the road. So this would be Pike Street. This would be the driveway into the country club. This would be kind of the parking lot for Aldi's right here. Another kind of interesting aerial is uh, of Green Street and Phillips School uh, shortly after it was constructed. Notice there was no gymnasium on the end of the school. There's also no Pioneer Park. Pioneer Park's in this area right here. What you do have is a robust um, neighborhood uh, with the Remington Rand plant in the middle of it and the train tracks leading out to it and then back on this siding. Uh, and then really pretty dense neighborhoods. Uh, many of these houses aren't here now. And um, it was really a, a, a key neighborhood um, for people that lived in Marietta. A uh, later photo that I included because it kind of shows two ears. You have the the um, train uh, using the uh, yard that was across the road from where Tampico's is, but you're missing the train station which had been torn down at, at, at that point. On Marietta College, you have the rather new Herman Fine Arts and the dorms that were built in the 60s. So this. This photo would have been shot uh, at some point in the 1960s before the tracks were removed. Marietta was home to a huge industry for about 100 years, and that was the manufacturing of grindstones. And, and they're all shipped out by rail, which as we'll learn from Cyrus was the main reason for the rail system here. But it was um, a, a hard, occupation and um, a lot of people got hurt do doing it um, part, partly because of the dust from the manufacturing of it. So here we see them on a flat car being shipped from uh, the yard that was on 2nd Street. Here we see them being um, quarried from the Vita Road area near Dunham in September 1941. So this was a huge operation. Uh, they quarried them and shipped them all over the world until synthetics kind of replaced the need for them. So a lot of them remain. If you view the college boathouse, you'll see them in the walls. Uh, this is a stack of them along a uh, wetlands area near Route 7 and um, in Constitution near the uh, catfish pond. 
And this is a pile of uh, discarded ones that are on a hiking trail behind the Washington County Career Center. Easy hike from the parking lot. Uh, it's kind of a cool place. Um, some of them are in, in a little pond, some of them are just stacked up. And uh, it's about a quarter mile from, from the parking lot. So let's look at some other photos of Marietta. So if you look in the center of the top photo, you see the, the Thornley Brothers building and the rail sheds that were part of the, the uh, train area. Uh, you see farmers taking their merchandise uh, to be shipped. So that building still remains. And a current day photo of the parking lot can kind of help you wrap your brain around where all these buildings sat and where the rail cars would have been. People's Bank Theater. As we all know, it wasn't always the People's Bank Theater. It was the Colony Theater when we were growing up. It was the Hippodrome Theater uh, at a time before that. So uh, it, this photo was shot after uh, what looks like a large program. Uh, when I went to shoot the current day photo, it dawned on me that this photo would have been taken from the newsroom of the Marietta Times which was located in the building across the street from the theater uh, in the 1940s. So all the photos in this uh, top photo remain, um, and um, most of them have been um, kind of restored to the condition that they were in uh, in 1940. So it's kind of a neat, uh, a neat um, area that really looks much the way it did uh, when the photo was taken. I included this photo because I want everybody to notice the fashion. So uh, this is one of many Marietta floods. This would be the corner of Putnam and Front Street. And uh, everyone has their boots on, but they also have on overcoats, jackets, and ties, and top hats, and dresses. They didn't let a little water um, make them get sloppy. They, they went out dress for success, even though it looks like there was probably six inches of water on the street at that time. So I talked earlier about grocery stores moving around. This was one of at least five locations I found for Kroger. And this was uh, later in Uncle Bob's, and then it was at Marietta Food Center. But it's in the 200 block of Third Street, and is now in the Napa Auto Parts store. Uh, that brick building still exists behind the uh, modern uh, storefront. If you look at the back of the building, you'll see the stair stepping uh, of, of the trim. Okay, this is, if you're in the Armory parking lot on Front Street, this is a building directly across the street. Uh, so in, in 19, um, looks like in the late 30s, uh, this, this uh, building was for, for rent. It had been the leader department store. If you go to the building now and there's a sign in the window, it's, it's also for rent. Uh, at least the windows are. But if you look on the end of the building, you'll see what's called a ghost sign that you can actually see remnants of the sign that you see painted uh, on the building in the earlier photo. So it's kind of neat. You can find things and tie the past into the present just by uh, walking around and looking closely. Block one was located on the Muskingum between the Putnam Street Bridge and the Railroad Bridge. It was made unnecessary uh, when they built the Belleville Lock and raised the level to Ohio. If you look closely in the photo, you can actually see a sandbar out at the confluence. Uh, this was during low water, so uh, it looks like there's some work going on. You can see the Phoenix Mill in the background, some rail cars up on the bridge. Uh, to give you a view the other direction, you can see how that uh, dam that was in place kind of made the Muskingum and Marietta a little bit more navigable for uh, stern wheelers that would travel up and down. People's Bank, a real landmark in Marietta, uh, which opened in October 1924. I, I put some of these photos up because I want you guys to understand construction was so much difficult than it is today. So, you know, the whole building is wrapped in wood scaffolding um, when this photo was taken in April of, of that year. And uh, 
you know, think of the construction methods, how much more difficult it would have been. Uh, this is the building a few years later. We know this is probably 1938 because of not only the style of the cars, but these, these covered wagons that we find over the windows, they say for the Ohio. So that would have been commemorating the 150th anniversary, anniversary of Marietta being founded. So uh, that puts it at 1938. Uh, Front Street, uh, many of these buildings look very similar to what they look like when this photo was taken. F. F. W. Woolworths filled the space that American Flags and Poles occupies today, and they operated that location for, for many years. I'm told that during floods, they had a flood floor plan that they would just rearrange their stock and they would stay open and people would walk in through the water to shop. So the tenacity of people was incredible. So interesting photo, note the streetcar coming down the middle of it. So an unusual photo, this shows uh, St. Mary's Church uh, or what was St. Mary's Church, which moved in 1909 to its current location because this building flooded so often, being on Lower Fourth Street. So the building was converted into a garage where if you look at the signage, you could park your new cars in there, I assume in the winter. So you would drive them up what would have been the steps of the church and basically park in the sanctuary. So kind of remarkable photo. The building on the right remains and is, is office space today. So let's talk about struggles. So in 1913, a uh, building came floating down the Muskingum River during the catastrophic flood. It hit the Putnam Street Bridge, knocked, its, uh, knocked it off the piers and deposited it on, on the riverbank. That was the only connection people had from the east side to the west side because the railroad bridge also got damaged. So they built a floating bridge where you could get from one side of the river to, to the next. And that would have um, had to uh, be in place until the 1913 bridge was built that was not replaced until um, 2000 when the current bridge got put in place. So this is the view the opposite direction uh, down Putnam Street. And I just want you guys to look at the mess and appreciate how hard this would have been to clean up um, without modern equipment. So this would have been a clean up by hand job and no bobcats, no backhoes. Uh, this would have just been a, a dirty mess for the citizens to clean up. I kind of want to walk through a sequence with you. This is April 6, 1917. The Tell City was a sternwheeler that had uh, sunk near Little Hocking. So, you know, normally when a sternwheeler would sink, it would uh, kind of destroy it. But note the pilot house here. So the pilot house was removed, it was bought by a family. They put it in their backyard in Little Hocking, where they used it as like a little summer cabin for decades before donating it to the um, Ohio River Museum. So this, of course, is a W.P. Snyder, the, the major, which is part of the Valley Gem operation, and the Tell City Pilot House, which is up, actually up on the riverbank. And uh, a neat restoration, visible anybody using the bike path. Uh, it's part of the history of Washington County, and it's preserved at uh, the Ohio River Museum. Uh, the Bessie Mills Club, it started off as two houses on 4th Street. John Mills uh, helped create it uh, to honor his wife, Bessie Mills. And the two buildings were joined uh, and additions were built for uh, the pool and do dormitories and the gym. But the building pretty much still looks the way it did when it was um, constructed. Uh, it opened to the, the uh, women and girls of Marietta in 1927. So um, you can see the gym being, being built. Okay, so this is a corner that uh, has Marietta's only skyscraper, known by most simply as the Dime Bank Building. 
You know, the Dime Bank is long gone. The First National Bank was there before. West Banco was there after. Uh, the buildings to the left of it remain. The train station called Union Depot uh, is not. It was built in 1890, removed in 1944, and that would be exactly where the parking lot is today. So the, the high school um, was uh, constructed in 1925, uh, and um, published reports show it uh, being built without a uh, gymnasium. So the, the thought was that the kids would, would go downtown, uh, the guys to the Betsy Mills, or the guys to the armory, the, the girls to the Betsy Mills, and that didn't go over very well. And they they uh, a year later built the gym. So uh, that was built um, nearly 100 years ago, and of course, it's still in use today. Not in use today is the Williamstown Bridge. It was built in 1902, also using massive amount of wood scaffolding to build a uh, very um, sturdy main span that went from the middle pier to, to West Virginia. Uh, it was built so that they could cantilever it out over the channel uh, before connecting it with the um, span coming from the Ohio side uh, without interrupting the sternwheel traffic that would have passed underneath it. You know, everything that goes up must come down, so uh, the, the bridge was um, blown off its piers in five different operations. Uh, and, um, and, and, and and replaced by the current bridge. I shot this photo and when, when the bridge hit the water, the, the river is, is only like 15 feet deep. This woman uh, screamed, oh my God, it's floating. And of course it wasn't floating, it was sitting on the river bottom, but that, that was a lot of steel to bring down. So, so uh, the new bridge was constructed in 1992. So, uh, you, know, you know, if you think about it, our new bridge is nearly 30 years old. And, you know, as part of the levee, which is still enjoyed by uh, a huge number of people, both for Sternwell and other activities, the river trail now crosses underneath it. And of course, the levee is a popular spot for uh, bird life that hangs out just the way the people do there, so. Okay. Uh, I would love to answer any questions that you guys may have, and I think uh, I think Kyle may have some questions. So, yeah. So I will go ahead and mention that if you have questions, now is a good time to put those either into the Q and A feature or into the chat feature, and we will get to those. <clears throat> Art, we have two right away. One is from Steve, and he asks, "I we." I believe the Cadwalder studio operated during the Civil War era. Where was it and are those photo collections available? You know, I've seen some of those photos. I, I've never seen like a, um, like a complete grouping of them. Uh, I'm not sure where it operated. I, I've seen some photos from that era uh, of like Front Street. I think it, I think it was probably in the Front Street area. That's that seemed to be where most businesses like that kind of settled. Um, you know, the, the the Putnam Street at that time still had homes on it. So uh, the, the big business district, of course, would have been down where the, the river was and kind of moved, slowly moved further up, probably due to flooding. But um, yeah, there, there are some photos. Uh, I think they're kind of part of the Hogue collection. Uh, you know, they kind of fall into that category of they've been copied so many times, no, no one's real sure what the origin is. But there's some photos of Marietta that have so many buildings in it that you don't recognize that it, 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 there's no current day thing to compare it to because the buildings were later replaced. So, so our second question comes from Marty, and um, the question is, uh, history never stops. So is anyone taking and archiving photos of Marietta events and places now? Well, you know, part of the problem now is everything's digital. 
And you, you know, you can have a, a glass plate from 1860 and, and make a print of it as good as, as, as it was in 1860. Uh, digital images won't last forever. They're relying on the technology to be able to, to, be able to read it. Uh, we had about 25 years worth of negatives uh, from the myriad of time. So we're talking thousands and thousands uh, of, of negatives. Think two SUVs full, that's how many negatives it were. And we donated those last year to the special collections. Uh, so they, they would be preserved and studied for um, future generations. So, so the former collections took us up, Durbrook Hope took us to the 60s. Then the, the ones we donated from the Times basically was about 15 years worth of negatives. And, and, and the moving forward in history right now, I, I'm frankly concerned about, you know, people are shooting more photos than they ever have, but are they archivally preserving them? And will we have the technology to read uh, the files in 100 years? You know, we can't read files that were from the 70s because no one has WordStar or other files anymore. So it, it could be a problem. All right, we have two other questions, which will make those the two last questions that we take. Um, Michael wants to know what or why does the new bridge have curves in it on the entrance from Marietta? Well, there was a, a big debate when, the, are we talking about the uh, Putnam Street Bridge or the or the, um, the Williamstown Bridge? Um, it doesn't specify. I'm going to oh. guess the Williamstown, perhaps. Yeah, let me answer both of them. They, they, they had a big debate about where to bring the, the Putnam Street, where to bring the Williamstown Bridge down um, before they finally settled on, on that spot. You, you know, reliant on both right of ways and, and how things would, would work out. If you brought it down on 4th Street, it would, would have had to cross Green Street because you didn't have enough space to bring it down that far. Uh, and, you know, I recall the debate, they had five options and, and after public hearings, they decided to bring it down the way it is. The Putnam Street Bridge has a curve in the middle because Putnam Avenue on the west side and Putnam Street on the east side uh, aren't at the same angle and you had awkward turns at the end of the straight bridge that preceded it. So when they built the Putnam Street Bridge, they curved it so both ends would line up. And it, the correct name of it is the Putnam Bridge because it's a bridge for both Putnam Street and Putnam Avenue. So. Okay, and our last question is from Grace and she asks, where was the old St. Mary's Church located? What did you say became of that building? Well, the old St. Mary's Church would be um, in the empty lot uh, directly south of the uh, Williamstown Bridge uh, on-ramp. And if you go there now, there's nothing there. Uh, the building that was in the photo is an accounting office. It used to be the pizza people place. Uh, if, if you lived in Marietta 40 years ago, it would have been Sam Yawblock's junkyard. And the, the white... Uh, building that was in the photo is actually um, was part of that junkyard. It, it was torn down in recent history. But that whole field's empty now. All right. Well, thank you very much, Art. Uh, we're going to go ahead and swing over to our next presenter, Cyrus Moore. Um, if you have any other questions for Art, you can go ahead and type those into the Q&A feature or into the chat. Um, and we will try to get those to you, get, the, get to those if we have time. Um, but for now, we'll go ahead and let Cyrus start his video and do his screen sharing. Thanks so much, Art. All right. Thank you, Kyle. Um, my name is Cyrus Moore. I am currently the director of the Baltimore Community Museum in uh, Fairfield County, Ohio, but I am from Athens and I frequently collaborate with Kyle and get to uh, work on various things in Marietta. So this presentation, which I will pull up right now, uh, is called Railroad Wildcatting in Southeastern Ohio the Marietta and Cincinnati line. Uh, this presentation evolved a little bit as I was uh, putting it together. So the 
original idea was to talk about the Marietta and Cincinnati line from uh, Athens, between Athens and uh, Marietta. It was one of those lines that made sense at the time, but uh, became outdated quickly. And I was gonna talk, put it in the context of uh, other such lines, but uh, it's evolved a little bit more into just the history of who used that line. And then uh, the second part of the presentation uh, is a series of photographs, mostly taken by me, uh, of uh, remaining uh, structures, mostly uh, culverts and uh, piers along that line. So let's start with uh, the growth and decline of the Marietta and Cincinnati Railroad as seen through uh, railroad maps. So the Marietta and Cincinnati Railroad started out as the Cincinnati and Belpre Railroad. It was first incorporated in 1845. There were uh, some major uh, proponents of uh, rerouting the line to Marietta, and so not long after it became the Marietta and Cincinnati Railroad. The idea was to link this, the uh, Ohio River towns of uh, Marietta and Cincinnati through an overland route. Uh, the route would then connect to the larger railroads in the east, uh, mainly the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, which had a terminus at Wheeling, Virginia at the time. Uh, this map shows the uh, route of the uh, railroad as it came into Cincinnati. You can see there were uh, plans to go uh, under some hills uh, and into town from the east, but the easiest route was to drop down from the north. Uh, this section of railroad was perhaps the easiest and to build and opened up in the 1850s. And this is an example of what a, uh, what a Marietta and Cincinnati Railroad engine would have looked like at the time uh, in the early, early to mid 1850s. Uh, the route opened from uh, Cincinnati to Chillicothe in 1855, uh, that being, as I said, the simplest part of the uh, whole route in regards to terrain. The next part was from uh, Chillicothe to Athens. That opened in 1856, and then in 1857, the uh, stretch from Athens to Marietta finally opened up. And that was the hardest to uh, construct because maintaining the grade meant creating a lot of uh, aqueducts, culverts, uh, tunnels, and eventually bridges. Uh, though, uh, as we'll see, that wasn't the, uh, a lot of the first structures were switches instead of bridges, but I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, this is a Marietta and Cincinnati uh, engine in Chillicothe, and this is a little bit later. This is more of an 1860s. This is the uh, this is the style is more synonymous with the Civil War. The route here is a little bit hard to see, so we're going to uh, draw on it. The important part: the route goes from uh, Athens over to Marietta, and you can see uh, it crosses a, um, well, actually, you can't see it on this uh, map because it's not uh, topographical, but uh, there are a lot of hills and uh, hollows in this area. So in uh, this route, the railroad had four tunnels and at least two major uh, trestles. The uh, original line uh, was designed to go to towns such as Cutler and Vincent and then uh, New England in Athens County and then over to Athens through what's now Canaanville. It was Warren Station then. Uh, at the time these were up-and-coming towns and it made sense to the railroad's engineers to hit up these uh, communities and bypass uh, 
uh, a easier route that followed the Hawking River. Uh, let's see here. All right. Uh, let's clear all drawings. Okay. So that map that I just showed was from the uh, 1870s. By the 1880s, the route clearly changes. So the, the old route out of Marietta now goes over to Cutler and to Broadwell. And instead of connecting to Athens, goes up to, goes to Amesville and then up, while the uh, Athens route goes down. Uh, follows the river, or goes down to the river and follows it over to Belpre. You can still reach Marietta this way. Uh, by this time, the uh, Baltimore and Ohio short line had come into existence. It was a another uh, uh, line that was built with the intention of connecting to other railroads, and it was built for the express purpose of shortening the route uh, out of Athens and going to Belpre. And by following the Hawking River, it avoided coming uh, into any major hills or valleys and uh, didn't require any large trestles or long tunnels. The uh, route from uh, Warren Station to Broadwell was abandoned at this time, and that includes the Pilcher Tunnel that we'll see pictures of. Uh, also worth noting at this time, the uh, Moonville and mineral tunnels uh, are still in use. Uh, this all becomes, this route becomes uh, property of the Baltimore and Ohio, which is what the original uh, incorporators of the railroad intended uh, some 40 years prior. The other route, the northern route here, uh, becomes part of the Marietta Cincinnati and Cleveland Railroad and links those through those three cities, but not in a very um, straight route. It hits up a lot of uh, smaller towns uh, and other, other cities along the way. So clear all drawings and move to the next. All right, this is a map from 1918 and it shows the next step uh, in the evolution of the railroad. So the tunnels uh, to the west of Athens are maintained, maintained by the Baltimore and Ohio. And the old Baltimore and Ohio short line is now the main route from Athens over to Belpre, and you can go up to Marietta from there. The line that uh, the original Marietta uh, and Cincinnati line uh, only goes as far as Vincent. Uh, by 1918, the rest having been abandoned and the, the other line going uh, from Amesville just up to Lathrop. At this point, the, the line from the original Marietta and Cincinnati line had uh, dealt with a lot of uh, deterioration and uh, it was deemed just uh, un, untenable. So where Cutler had been along the railroad uh, it, by 1918 is cut off. Originally, well, uh, not long after the Marietta, Cincinnati and Cleveland abandoned the route, the uh, Marietta Mineral Railroad was formed by Marietta citizens to keep the track alive and bring uh, ore, or sorry, uh, coal out of the hills. Uh, this railroad was bought up by other railroads and eventually became just the Marietta and Vincent Railroad by this point, by 1918. Uh, shortly after this, it is reduced even further and becomes uh, a railroad that is simply for hauling out the uh, um, grindstones, uh, like the ones that Art showed, uh, from the area around, uh, let's see, uh, what's now uh, Moore's Station, if you're on seven. Uh, this final section was abandoned uh, in 1924 when the Vanderwalker Tunnel finally uh, collapsed. 
and we'll show pictures of that soon. So uh, I hope everyone uh, could follow along with that. It's a little hard showing such a, a broad thing on these maps, but now we will get to the photographs. I hope they'll make sense. So tunnels and bridges, these are the remnants of the original line. This is the Vanderwalker Tunnel that I talked about. Uh, it was started, uh, construction started on it in 1855, and it was finished about 10 years later. It was uh, 1,300 feet uh, long, but uh, the interesting thing about it is it ran right through uh, where a creek bed had been coming off of a hill. So the creek had to be, the stream had to be rerouted. And you can see it very clearly here in this trough that goes above the train tracks. Uh, when the, in 1924, when the uh, tunnel was finally abandoned, uh, this stream had started to reclaim its original course, and that is what deteriorated the tunnel itself. But all things considered, 60 some years is not too bad of a run. Uh, this uh, is the uh, Roddy Road culvert, and it is between um, let's see, it is between Vincent and Cutler, so it was uh, disused by uh, 1918, by the 1918 map, but it's a very uh, classic example of the kind of stonework that uh, went into construction of this. This uh, structure itself was probably built uh, in the 18, late 1850s, 1860s. Uh, the year 1858 was uh, a very wet year and washed out a lot of the original construction. So a lot of this, so some of the surviving examples are uh, much more robust uh, pieces that were uh, put in a little bit later. This is the Dunbar Piers. Uh, it is uh, what remains of a, a large bridge that spanned one of the deepest hollows along the old route. Originally, in the 50, 1850s and early 1860s, the railroad used a series of switches to go down one side of the uh, hollow and then up the other. But uh, in the mid-1860s, construction began on, on this, and it was in use up until uh, about 1916. Uh, and yeah, it's uh, when you go out there today, before the leaves come on, you can still see the piers very clearly. It's, uh, they're very impressive. Uh, this is a uh, culvert that is near Cutler, and uh, it looks a lot like the uh, stonework that uh, Art showed that uh, is now under the uh, under Fourth Street in Marietta. This one is still in use as well, and uh, holds a big run road that uh, follows the old railroad tracks. And as far as I know, uh, when this, as soon as the railroad tracks were abandoned, uh, this road uh, took over and is maintained today. This is the uh, Pilcher Tunnel in Athens that caught fire a number of times uh, during its use and was the first feature to be abandoned after the B&O short line uh, became operational in the early 1870s. Uh, this picture is taken probably in the 40s or 50, 1940s or 50s, and uh, I don't think there's anything left today. But you can see it clearly where the uh, the uh, entrances were uh, on a topographical map or Google satellite map. Uh, this is just another culvert. This one is still in use. It's in front of the Athens County Engineer's Office. Then on the other side of Athens were... Uh, are two tunnels that were used by the B&O uh, as late as the uh, 1980s, and they are the, the Mineral Tunnel, or King Switch Tunnel, close to Mineral. And uh, here's what it looks like today. Uh, and then this is Moonville Tunnel, which uh, is still in existence and is now part of a uh, rail trail, I think is what they're calling it but uh, you can go out there and see it. Uh, so this uh, presentation uh, is just a walkthrough of the, the history behind 
these features and I encourage you to, as I have done, go out and try to find these places because they're uh, a very interesting part of the uh, history of this era or this area and it's uh, a glimpse into an era before railroads became the the major conglomerates that they they did by the 1900s and they were still small scale operations that uh, serve very rural areas. All right, uh, Kyle, do we have some questions? Yes, uh, thank you, Cyrus. So we have one question so far and I'll just go ahead and remind everyone, if you have a question, please feel free to put it in the uh, Q&A feature. Also check out the chat. Um, there has been some discussion about the uh, Cadwalder question. Uh, so if you want to find that answer there, um, there's a few uh, back and forth that went into the chat, so check that out. But anyways, back to Cyrus. Uh, the uh, question that came in was from Marty, and he asked, the Dunbar Piers are a stunning sight, but real well, real well hidden. Do you think they will ever become an official historical, an official Ohio historical site? Oh, uh, it really seems unlikely just because of the remoteness of them. I think their real appeal uh, is that they're not an official uh, site. I think that knowing that they're uh, kind of a well-kept secret is the big draw and they're not easy to find. Even after finding them on my own one time, I've still, I still missed the road uh, trying to find it a few times until I got it down. All right, thank you. We have two more, well, three more questions came in. Um, so the second one is, what was the cost for these for these lines, and what was hauled on on them on the railroad? Uh, so the the I'll answer the second part first. So the the idea was to haul uh, goods and passengers uh, and through that overland route because the the river in this era was not well controlled so the uh, railroad could be seen as more reliable uh, for both goods and and people as i said uh, but this did evolve and as i mentioned the marietta mineral railroad uh, that took over the old line in the 1880s and 90s had the express purpose of uh, taking coal and then later uh, uh, grindstones out of the area and then the first part, the cost, uh, the, there are records and reports of the uh, Marietta and Cincinnati Railroad, so you can find the exact numbers. I don't know them off the top of my head, but they were a lot. It took a lot of money and a lot of foreign investment, mainly from England at this time, to make this possible. And the returns were slow, uh, sporadic, and sometimes non-existent, and just about every railroad at one point or time went under. The Marietta in Cincinnati was reformed at least twice and still became uh, at one point uh, part of the larger b and We actually had uh, several questions come in, so we might wanna try to limit the response to these so we get everyone done uh, in, a, in a good time. Uh, so if you can quickly answer the uh, MNC in 1864 ended at Loveland outside Cincinnati. When was it completed and did it take the northern route into the city? Uh, I'm, I need to go over and see that uh, side of it because I'm not as familiar with that side. But my understanding is the original northerly route connected to uh, the uh, Miami, Little Miami Railroad maybe was the name of it. Uh, and then uh, in 1864, that's when the Marietta and Cincinnati opened up its uh, westerly route through Batavia and into Cincinnati that way. Okay. But the original uh, 1855 you... route was north. Gotcha. So Judy asks, did I hear you say that this railroad system um, was begun to move grindstones? No, it was not originally meant to move grindstones, but it became... Uh, the grindstones became the primary uh, cargo uh, late in its existence. Uh, you're muted, Kyle. Yeah, there we go. Sorry about that. Dennis asks, what can you tell us about the Marietta branch operated by the Pennsylvania Railroad? 
Uh, is that if that's the branch north that goes north of uh, Marietta, that's my next project is to go up and see uh, the connection between uh, North Marietta and Wheeling. I've seen some uh, great photos of the stone culverts and bridges up there. And yeah, hopefully soon I'll be able to document all of that and do another presentation. All right, great. Uh, Peggy asks in Julia Cutler's journal, uh, Civil War Journal. She often mentions her brother William going to Chillicothe on the cars. What were the passenger cars like? Uh, they were uh, smaller. So if you think back to the image of the, the second locomotive, uh, it's bigger, but still not that big. Uh, that's the kind of uh, engine that would have carried uh, those cars. I think at that time they would have held about 20 to 30 passengers, would not have had many amenities. They were mostly uh, meant for day travel, if I, I'm thinking of the right ones. Sure. So the second to last question that we have came from Steve. It asked, did the MNC fail after the Panic of 1873? Uh, it did. The Panic of 1873 was very uh, uh, complex and uh, and hit at some interesting times uh, in transportation. Like I think part of it was a uh, disease that killed a lot of horses uh, contributed to it. For the Marriott in Cincinnati, the biggest thing was that the uh, B&O short line uh, along the Hawking River came up at that time. So I'm sure they were facing uh, economic troubles just from less commerce going on, less cargo in general, but their biggest threat was just a, that competing railroad that had come up with a better route and a route that was cheaper to maintain. Great. And the last question is from Grace and she asked, what was the travel time from Marietta to Cincinnati by river and how much time was cut when making the trip by rail? Oh, that is a good question. Uh, the Ohio History Connection actually has a card that from the Marietta and Cincinnati that has the time of arrival for uh, the different stations. So I don't know off the top of my head uh, what that was. I'm, uh, it's, that's possible to look up and that's a very good question. But the key was not cutting down travel time, it was travel reliability. Uh, floods uh, and, well, the, the uh, river was, at, was not dammed and so it was at the mercy of floods and droughts. Whereas a railroad uh, was far more reliable, uh, you just had to clear snow off of it and maintain it. Okay, great. So that is all the questions. I have one last thing to mention here, uh, but first I wanna say thank you to Cyrus for joining us and talking about the railroad. Uh, we hope everyone enjoyed it. And also thank you to Art. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen quickly with everyone before we all say goodbye. Um, let's go to, oh, maybe not, just give me a quick second. So we do want to say thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, we did want to note that if usually these are paid programs, but this is our first ever virtual conversation or first ever virtual third Thursday talk. So if you don't mind, if you everyone is feeling generous and would like to make a donation for tonight's uh, talk, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, and you can find the link for making a donation in the chat feature. Also, if you go to uh, mariacastle.org, our website is under the support tab. And lastly, I will also mention that we are doing our membership drive with a special uh, feature this year. And that is if you join anytime this year, your membership is gonna be automatically extended through January of 2022. So you get an extended membership just because of all the um, delays and also the cancellations that we've had this year and may have in the fall. So we are looking at that and want to make sure that you get the most out of your membership. So we did want to mention that. But lastly, I just wanted to say thank you to Art and Cyrus for joining us. Uh, we hope everyone enjoyed uh, this conversation. And uh, we uh, will mention that even though we are doing um, virtual in place of doing a physical program, 
in the future, we do going to continue our virtual offerings. So even when we are able to have physical third Thursdays, we do hope to offer um, virtual access to those as well. So just like you are online now, you will be able to get online if you can't make it to the castle for, for third Thursdays. Um, but also we are looking at the other virtual offerings. Our entire history camp, as mentioned before, is gonna be virtual. So um, we will have a lot more of those offerings in the future. So again, thank you everyone for coming and uh, we hope you have a nice evening. Thank you.